vẫn không lên vẫn không lên là sao nhỉ? Hay bên live now I think. Hi everybody and welcome to this uh, series of business talks. This is the second in the uh, School of Business and Management business talks and it's entitled EVFTA, Opportunities for the Transformation and Diversification of the Vietnamese Economy. We're going to be uh, joined by three people today uh, and they are Mr. Ki An Lee and uh, Dr. John Walsh and also Dr. Chung Nguyen. So first of all, I'd like to introduce our uh, key speakers for today. And Lee, uh, Lee Ki An is the economist and trade specialist of the delegation of the European Union to Vietnam. He's worked with that delegation since 2004, and he's witnessed a whole range of things, including the negotiation and conclusion of several treaties key trade agreements between Vietnam and the European Union. He's got extensive experience in trade, economic investment matters, and he's a leading expert in the European political and economic issues. His recent activities include the analysis of some Vietnam's economic sectors and their technical barriers, which have been important inputs for the negotiation of the bilateral free trade agreement between Vietnam and the European Union. Le Kian has experience in the knowledge of regional politics, in particular, the bilateral relations between Vietnam and Australia, and he's worked as a senior defence researcher of the Australian Embassy in Hanoi for almost five years. During this period, he was among the group of people who set up the Australian Defence Attaché Office in Hanoi, as well as the first exchanges of military delegations and cooperation programmes in the defence area. He was a journalist of the political newsroom of Vietnam Television Channel from 96 to 2000. He's got an MA in Public Administration and a BA in International Relations. The presentation from Kai An today is a presentation on the EU, Vietnam Trade Agreement and Opportunities and Challenges. Our second speaker today is Dr. John Walsh. John has a DPhil thesis uh, on market entry strategy um, and it's from the University of Oxford uh, and he obtained that in the last millennium. So a very experienced person with considerable experience in market research and marketing consultancy in the UK uh, prior to the resumption of his academic career. His academic career spans many years. I think it was 16 years in Thailand and he joined us from uh, bank, a university in Bangkok uh, a few years ago. Uh, John is um, a, currently our program manager for international business. He's got experience in conducting international research and his talk today will be concerned with um, also opportunities for the transfer, transformation and diversification of the Vietnam economy. So thank you very much to these two key speakers. This is, as I said earlier, the second business talk. We plan for a third one on Wednesday, the 3rd of June. And in that, uh, we will contact everybody to let them know what that talk will be about. But for the time being, I'd now like to pass over to Dr. Chung Nguyen, who will now introduce our speakers directly. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Thank you, Thank Associate, you. Associate Professor Robert McLellan. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So on behalf of the uh, teams in today's presentation, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to this very special topic. That's the EVFTA, uh, the opportunities for transformation and diversification of the Vietnamese economy. So like Bob mentioned, um, uh, Mr. Kian will present in a second. But before we, we go for it, I do a very short intro, intro, introduction to the um, EVFTA. And by chance, right now, the government, the parliament is discussing at the moment, at the parliament of Vietnam on this particular, if Kian, I, I mean, uh, Mr. Kian also know about that. And the Minister of Trade answering all the question of the delegate from the Vietnamese uh, uh, you know, a delegate at the parliament right now. So, um, if, if 
you um, and Vietnam, we call EVFTA, actually the new generation uh, free trade agreement between Vietnam and 28 European um, Union members, but soon to be 27, right? So because of Brexit. And this is really comprehensive and high quality agreement um, that for both Vietnam and EU. And when enter, entering into force, the FTA will expect it to be the huge boost for Vietnam exports, diversify the market. Exports. While there is a lot of benefits, there are also a lot of challenges. So our two speaker will, will talk about that um, in a second. So without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Ki and to go first. Uh, some background noise eh? Yep. Now over to you, Mr. Kian. Thank you very much, Dr. Chung. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John Wars. It is my great honor to go to have uh, your invitation and to join this uh, very interesting discussion in my view. Um, I would like to start uh, by first uh, talking why it is so important for us to have the free trade agreement uh, with the European Union. By us, I mean Vietnam. Uh, here I know that uh, we have uh, some of our audience from other countries, uh, maybe from Australia, from Canada, from uh, South Korea. Uh, so uh, I also would like to talk uh, in a wider context uh, of the significant impact of the FGA between the and Vietnam on the third parties. Uh, so I would like now to uh, go to the second uh, slide. In my presentation, I will have two main parts. The first part uh, is about uh, the bilateral relationship between Vietnam and EU. I would like to give you kind of uh, the context uh, where we are now and why Vietnam and EU need each other. Why Vietnam and EU need to have a deeper engagement in economic trade and investment. Uh, about Vietnam and EU, uh, there is one significant uh, um, uh, factor uh, of the bilateral trade. Trade has been growing on a continuous basis for the past 15 years. On average, each year, EU enjoyed a growth of between 5 to 7 percent in exports to Vietnam. By the same token, or even at a larger extent, Vietnam enjoyed something like 10 to 15 percent on average each year of its export to the EU. And there were some particular years in the past where I witnessed Vietnam export to EU even increased by 25%, 25%. And that is why you can say that the two sides really need each other because the two sides have already identified a lot of potential growth in the bilateral trade. Uh, talking about Vietnam EU trade, uh, there is one very important factor we should not ignore that is a big surplus in the commercial link that Vietnam enjoy with the EU or a big deficit that EU is having. And if you take a look, a closer look at the data in 2018, you will see the deficit was 27 billion euros. And you can see from 2008 to 2018, the surplus that Vietnam had or the deficit that EU had has grown from 5 billion to 27 billion. And this year that data was slightly less. It's around 25 billion in 2019. And it is a persistent trend. And the surplus that Vietnam is having with the EU helped Vietnam to balance its global trade deficit. In general, only trading with EU and with the USA that Vietnam has such big surplus. And this is really meaningful to Vietnam um, trading activities. And in the next slide, I would like to remind you the evolution of Vietnam key exports to the EU during 2007 and 2017, over the past 10 years. I have not yet had time to update this, but uh, I think the trend remained the same. Um, for 2018 and 2019. And you can see here that Vietnam has shifted its pattern of exports 
from raw materials long, long time ago to labor intensive, to agro products, and now even industrial products like telephone and machines. And you can see it is just a big surprise to all of us. 20 years ago, we never thought that one day Vietnam could export smartphones. One day Vietnam could export machines, equipment, electric, even the means of transport like trucks to the EU. Nowadays, with the strong growth of FDI, with the vibrance of the Vietnam's private sector, we are doing the things which we thought impossible in the past. And in the next slide, I would like to talk about the way of EU markets in Vietnam's global trading. And this one is about 2018, but in 2019, it's almost unchanged. It's almost the same. Here, EU continue to consume on average from 16% to 21% of Vietnam's exports to the world market. And EU has been the second most important market for Vietnamese exports, only after the US. And after the US, the EU are trailing closely. And there were some years, like three years ago, four years ago, EU was number one market. So you can see between EU and USA, there is kind of the um, catching up each other in, pan, in, in, in tandem. Uh, the next one, I will tell you why Vietnam and EU had such strong growth and why Vietnam enjoy a big surplus. If you take a closer look at the history of the trading, you will see that there are three reasons. First, the unilateral GSP scheme that the EU have granted to Vietnam. GSP, what is it? It is a generalized system of preferences. It is something the big trading partners like EU, like Japan, like the USA offer to developing countries. And the tariff of GSP normally is around 3.5% lower than the WTO rate. So I will give you an example. If Vietnam export coffee to a country which are the members of WTO. And if the tariff is 15%, its export to the EU will be at least 3.5% less than that. Actually, for products like coffee, the tariff under the GSP is 0%. No tariff at all. And about 20 to 21% or even 30% sometimes of Vietnam's export to the EU are now subject to the GSP. And that is why Vietnam has got such a wonderful growth of exports to the EU market over the past 25 years, 25 years. The second factor that helped Vietnam to maintain such strong and robust growth of exports to the EU market, that is the strong performance of FDI sector and the vibrant private sector of Vietnam. Uh, about 70 to 75% of Vietnam's uh, export revenues are contributed by the FDI partners, uh, FDI enterprises. And that is why the growth of Vietnam's trading is so much associated with the growth of FDI. And that is why the EU-Vietnam Free Trade Agreement and Investment Protection Agreement will well both a new wave of FDI, a new era of uh, export growth, and in a wider context of economic growth for Vietnam's economy. That is my strong belief. Coming back to the three reasons behind Vietnam's strong growth of exports to the EU, the third one, and very important one, is a complementary feature. Now you are taking a look at the Vietnam main export products to the EU. You can see we export a lot of, let's say, labor intensive, like footwear, which account for nearly 11% of Vietnam's export to the world. Textile and garments, almost 6% to the EU out of the total number to the world. Coffee, computer parts, you can see that. It's just a lot. Uh, telephone. There is a very interesting story about telephone, which I would like to talk later, and please remind me if I forget. 
If you come to the next slide, you will see the main exports of EU to Vietnamese market. What are they? They are machinery, mechanical appliances. They are things like alcoholic beverages. They are things like um, optical surgery and medical or pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical is very important. So here, what I would like to highlight is the complementary features. Vietnam mainly export the thing which you do not produce or don't want to produce or cannot produce. And EU export to Vietnam the things that Vietnam cannot produce, like aircraft, like very advanced pharmaceutical products, which Vietnam are in need of. So for us, the EU Vietnam Free Trade Agreement is just a very good one, a very correct one. Right now, Vietnam have got already 14 FTAs in, the, in, in place. Don't forget, 14. But the EVFTA will be a very special one. I can guarantee you. Why I say so? The pre, in the previous time, especially the very first FTA that Vietnam signed and implemented in the past, they are mainly with the economies in the region. They are mainly with the economies which have direct competition against Vietnam. And that is why those FTAs sometimes do not bring much benefits. Sometimes even they bring or they create problems for Vietnamese domestic economy. And I trust that uh, Dr. John Walsh will later talk a lot about those opportunities for Vietnamese companies out of the EV FTA. And the next one, the next slide. I want to talk about FDI. Right now, in 2018, and even in 2019, the data only slightly increased. You will notice one thing. EU is the fifth largest FDI partner of Vietnam. Why still the, the fifth largest EU 28 compared to South Korea, Japan, Singapore, Taiwan? Why we are, we are only the fifth? There are two reasons. First, up to now, the Vietnamese uh, legal system, the legislation, are not yet uh, attractive to the EU investors. Second, much a considerable number of EU capital have been invested into Vietnam via third territories like uh, British Virgin Islands, like um, any territories like Cayman Islands, those are what we call the tax haven. Those are where the investments seem to be better treated and protected. But the FTA, FDI, uh, FTA between EU and Vietnam will change. We change that mentality of investors because the free trade agreement between EU and Vietnam is accompanied by the investment protection agreement. When we move to the part about the FTA and IPA, I will tell you more why it's so important for the, for the investors from Europe and even for the investors from the third party. And next, I would like uh, to talk about the second and the most important part of my presentation today. I would like to talk about the FTA. Uh, as Dr. Chung already mentioned, it is a new generation agreement. And as Dr. Chung mentioned about the National Assembly discussion and ratification, of the free trade agreement. I would like to share with you the agenda of Vietnam's parliament on the ratification. Uh, the latest information I've got from the National Assembly, the free trade agreement will be voted uh, on the 28th May. The free trade agreement and the investment protection agreement will be voted on 28th May. And maybe some days later, it will be the uh, ILO Convention 105 on forced labor. Why I mentioned to the ILO Convention, please remind me, Dr. Chu, <laughs> I will tell later. Because this is a new generation, the, 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 the 21st century agreement, it covers a lot. On this slide, you can see the FTA between you and Vietnam, it covers trade in goods, of course. It is about the market access, market access for goods and tariffs, 99% of the tariff lines. Rules of origin, of course how to satisfy, how to make sure that your products to the EU market can get the zero tariff. It also talk about export duties. Don't forget, 
And not many FTA talk about export duties, but in the in the EU Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, we touch upon export duties because the EU believes that there should not be any restriction of export of important commodities like the rare earth, some, something like that, some minerals. But Vietnam still has the right to control a little bit, and there is a list of some products, some materials, which Vietnam have the right to impose export duties. Uh, this agreement talk about TBT, technical barrier to trade. Uh, I often make a joke, uh, and sometimes students find it so funny. Uh, like uh, FTA, in an FTA, they talk, you can export the apple to my market uh, on the condition that the, the, the apple should be as big as a watermelon. <laughs> so you can see why TBT is so important. TBT is there to make sure that you do not impose any excessive requirements as a precondition for your export of product. Or in other words, the two sides must work on a reasonable and justified uh, reason, justification based on science. So we make sure that products exported from one economy to another economy, vice versa, are facilitated. Of course, they must satisfy key important requirements like SPS, sanitary and phytosanitary measures. What does it mean, SPS? It is to make sure that any top products from the EU to Vietnam are clean. There is no animal disease, no mad cow disease. It is to make sure that any shrimp and pangasius filet exported by Vietnamese companies to the EU are free from salmon, uh, salmonella, I'm sorry, and are, are hygienically uh, safe for the consumers in Europe. Those are the things. SPS measures can also be concerned with the packaging, like the materials you used to package something for the human consumption to be safe too. So this FGI go very specifically to all the technical areas with very clear language that customers, that stakeholders understand. Uh, in this FGA, we have also chapter about customs and trade facilitation. Uh, why it's so important? Trade facilitation are there to make sure that all the custom procedures are not over excessive. To make sure that the exporters can at any time extract that in a very quickest time saving, money saving. And it's so meaningful to the, to the enterprises. I could give you three examples about the custom and trade facilitation under the EU Vietnam FTA as an example, as a demonstration for why it is that FTA is a new generation agreement. In the EU Vietnam FTA, you don't have to go to the authority and request for the proof of origin. Any one of you here, if you are experienced a bit or engaging a bit with import and export activities, you know it so well. Before you can export, before your consignment can be leaving the port in Vietnam, you need to have in your hand the proof of origin, a paper. Sometimes it can be the, the template A, for GSP, it can be other template, can be KF, it can be anything, but it is really time consuming to get that. But in the EU Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, companies can certify themselves. Companies need to work with authorities, for example, the EU, they work with the EU authority to make sure that their companies and their names are in the list of the database and then they can export the product and they can certify the rule of origin by themselves. This is very facilitated, you can see that. Of course, in Vietnam, Vietnamese authorities have not yet decided to undertake such approach. In Vietnam for the several years, they still go the traditional way, but then they will consider the approach, the advanced approach as suggested by the EU side because it is uh, possible for also Vietnam to apply the same 
uh, chest facilitation. The second example, I would like to give you to talk about how facilitative, facilitative of the FGA, the chapter on the custom and trade facilitation. Once Vietnam or EU exports, they can also combine the exports in one consignment. Let me give you an example. If the EU want to export, let's say, one consignment of alcoholic beverages, spirits, whiskey to Vietnam, but they also want to export to Singapore. So they can send the consignment to Singapore, they can split the consignment, and then they, they continue exporting the product to Vietnam. So under the EU-Vietnam free trade agreement, the split of consignment is allowed on the condition that there is no alteration of the consignment. So this is completely different. I can tell you you cannot find it in CPTPP. You cannot find it in the ASEAN FTA. You cannot find it in the FTA between Vietnam and Japan, FTA between Vietnam and Korea, or FTA between Vietnam and Australia and New Zealand. There is no such provision of the uh, trade facilitation. Uh, I'll, come to, I'll come to the next one and talk about services and investment. Actually, the part about services and, uh, and investment uh, already uh, covered by the IPA. Uh, if I may, I would like to tell you a bit about the history. At first, there is only one single agreement, that is a free trade agreement. And the free trade agreement has one important chapter about investment. After that, the EU decided to split it into investment protection agreements and free trade agreements. There is one good reason behind it, because investment still belongs to the competency of the member states of the EU, and it does not belong to the European Commission. That is why we want to make sure that once we ratify the FTA, the FTA will take um, uh, effectiveness. Uh, the, FTA, the FTA will be enforced on day one. That is why we want to split it, to make sure that all the ratification concerning the investment will be done in a proper time and the member states have enough time to think about it before they vote. But at the same time, companies from both economies still enjoy the benefits and the tariff uh, phasing out of the FTA. So here in this FTA, it is a new generation FTA because it also has a very good investment protection mechanism. It has very good coverage of the services. And also it has the cross-cutting issues. What are they? They are government procurement. If anyone asks you about the difference between the EU-Vietnam FTA and the CPTPP, you can immediately refer to the government procurement. Here, commitments are deep and very extensive. Here is where the EU can access to the public tenders of 32 to 37 public hospitals in Vietnam, where the EU investors can bid uh, any procurement by, uh, let's say, the Railway uh, Corporation of Vietnam, Vietnam Allies, uh, or any ministries, any ministries, any state agencies. It is covered widely, and it is so good. It's not only good for the EU in terms of market access, it's good for Vietnam. Because, don't forget one thing, investors from EU, they are subject to transparency. They are subject to the good governance. And once they join any bidding, it will be very transparent. And it helps to mature the efficiency and the effectiveness of using the state budget in any public procurement. Here we also have the trade remedies, the competition policy, the state owned enterprises. It is also a very interesting part, but I'm very sorry that with the time limit, I cannot talk everything. I want to underline the second important thing to the business community. Anytime you talk about FGI, don't forget about this. It is an intellectual property right. No one wants to invest. No one wants to sell any products if they know that their IPR are threatened. And here in the EU-Vietnam FTA, we have very important commitments in IPR to make sure that the EU pharmaceutical products 
once they are in circulation in Vietnamese market, they are not copied. And under the IPR, we also have the GI. What does it mean? Geographical indication. It is special, special ownership for community, for traditional producers. I will give you example about Vietnamese agricultural products. We've got 39 products being protected as GI under the EU Vietnam Free Trade Agreement. And we've got 169 products from EU. Uh, example, the Thanh Hà Lê Chi. The Thanh Hà Lê Chi or Phu Quốc fish sauce. In the past, a Thai producer already claimed Phu Quốc fish sauce as a brand name from Thai. And at that time, Vietnamese legitimate producer and exporter of our fish sauce cannot enter EU market under the Phu Quốc, our name. It is really the geographical indication of Vietnam. But under the EU Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, our Fuku fish sauce has been recognized. The same like the Thanh Ha Li Chi. We have special fruits, we have special agricultural products, which should be protected and which should be sold at a higher price. Normally, the GI products will be sold about 15 to 30% higher compared to the normal commercial products. And that is why it's important. It is really a kind of IP, right? The same for the EU cheese, the same for the EU wine, like champagne, sparkling wine from France, you know that champagne, it will be protected, well protected in Vietnamese market. And that is why you will see in the future, if any producer, let's say like Dala Champagne, they have to change the name in the future, once the FTA is in place, because champagne, is particular register as GI for France and for the EU, something like that. That's a great example. Uh, we can discuss that in Q and A uh, because mm -hmm. we we have a time limit. So uh, we go with uh, all of the important thing in the next slide. I see a lot of important okay. things there. Sure. Yeah. But the example we save it for Q and A. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Chung. Please keep reminding me because I know I'm not so good at timekeeping. <laughs> Uh, now Second. I'm talking about uh, the tariff liberalization. As I mentioned before, 99% of the tariffs in both value and number of tariff lines will be eliminated. For the EU, let's say for the Vietnamese export to the EU, it will be fully eliminated after seven years. For the EU export to Vietnam, after 10 years. And it comes entry into force, 71% of Vietnamese exports on 84% of tariff life on day one, and 65% in value of EU export or 49% of tariff life in day one. You can see. Now, when we talk about FTA, we not only talk about how many tariff lines, we not only talk about the value, but we also talk about phasing out. And here it's what we call technical term in the WTO negotiation. The technical term is a uh, front loading. By front loading, we mean we remove, we, we, we do our commit on day one, a lot of it, much of it, the, the lion's share of it on day one, or at least in the first year, or at least in the first three years. And the next slide, please. In the next uh, slide, uh, I want to talk a bit about some tariff for specific sector. Uh, here I talk about uh, machinery and appliances, which are important for the EU. Um, almost all EU exports will fully liberalized at entry into force, and the rest will be in five years. So what are they? They are washing machine, huh? uh, they are coffee makers, tea makers, yeah, things like that. So don't worry, people often say, uh, Kiang, when you mention about it, you tend to protect EU a lot. You talk about so many good things. But I said, yes, it is good. It's really good. Come on. I'm not cheating you. Or you can come back to me. Um, it is really good because of the complementary, complementary feature. So all the products which enjoy the zero tariff on day one, or which will be liberalized within three to five years, are the products that you can produce, but Vietnam do not. And the same, by the same token, for Vietnamese side, 
the EU also liberalized the product that the EU are not competitive in production and Vietnam are doing much better and EU are willing to give it up, give it to partners like Vietnam. So we talk about car parts within seven years. Don't worry about car, CBU. CBU will be in 10 years. So Vietnam still have a lot of time. Although at the moment, I'm afraid that Vietnamese uh, automobile uh, industries have already been exposed to the influx of the CBU products from Thailand, from ASEAN, it's already from the 1st yeah. January 2018, I think, if memory serves me right. We talk about we can topic. discuss we can discuss that uh, further on because I'm afraid of okay. time now. So too much uh, for okay, next too slide. <laughs> less for, for John. For John, yeah. We are talking about dairy products uh, after five years. Uh, again, uh, Vietnam do not make good cheese. <laughs> EU they are make very good cheese. Of course, Vietnam produce milk, but EU are much better in producing milk. So after five years, we will got zero tariff products. We are talking about chicken, about frozen pork meat. I can tell you, negotiation was so bad on these products. And Vietnamese negotiators, they were brilliant. They were so good, very tough. We're talking about fishery, salmon, halibut, and trout, about wine and spirit, seven years. It is also an, a sector that Vietnam wants to, to protect. So it takes about uh, seven years before the EU uh, white sparkling wines, uh, EU beers, EU whiskey uh, can enjoy zero tariff. Uh, for beer, it's 10 years. The next slide, please. Uh, for Vietnam, this is one I want to highlight. Uh, Vietnam will enjoy uh, free, uh, uh, Vietnam can access to the EU market, uh, free tariff uh, for apparel or textiles, what I mean, textile and and, and garments, yes. After five to seven years for footwear, fully after seven years. Vietnam are quite strong in producing food, uh, footwear, by the way, don't forget. Vietnam are quite strong in producing textile and garments. Of course, you can argue against me that it is not Vietnam, it is FDI. Yes, I agree. But for the apparel, we have very strong companies. For footwear, a little bit less. Maybe, maybe mainly thanks to Nike and Adidas. Uh, Pangasius, only after three years. Rice, Swiss corn, garlic, all these things. Uh, Vietnam can enjoy the um, zero tariff on a tariff rate quota. There are a certain quota, especially for rice. But I don't have time to talk more now. Uh, I want to talk uh, about um, uh, other aspects of the free trade agreement and why it's so meaningful. First, we should admit one thing. Big companies, multinational companies, they don't need to have FTA. They can have that market access once they, where they want because they have very good resources. They have excellent networking. They have excellent political connection. So at any time, they can ask, for example, the government to knock on the door of the Vietnamese government to talk about that. But the FTA is more meaningful for SMEs. For SMEs from the Europe and for SMEs from Vietnam. Why? Because it removes all custom duties. Because all the rules, all the procedures will be simplified. As the example I had given to you some minutes ago, it's about the split of consignment. It's about the self-certification of rule of origin. All those things are so facilitating for the, for the producer, for the exporters, which do not have much capital, which do not have much resources. And it makes it easier to bid for contracts because of the eliminating ex expensive double testing in some areas. Let me tell you an example. In the EU Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, once you've got the laboratory in Vietnam, of course, the national standard laboratory uh, recognition of one particular agriculture products. It will not be tested again in EU and it saves a lot of time, a lot of money. And last but not least, it is about copyright. SMEs, what do they have? Of course, there are two groups. There are some who want to steal from others to copy, but there are one who are so brilliant and they want to do it right. And for SMEs, initiative is so important. For SMEs, 
once they have a, one brilliant idea and they register and they are protected, they can base on it to have further development. And the FTA between the EU and Vietnam lay a very solid protection ground for SMEs to make sure that copyright and intellectual property and uh, GI are well protected in both Vietnam and EU. That is why I like to, to highlight this part. And the last uh, slide I want to talk with you before I pass the floor to jo Dr. John Walsh. Um, I want to talk about challenges ahead. Uh, once uh, we think of the FTA, we often think, okay, it sounds so cool, but whether or not it, it can be effective in practice, yes, it will be. I have my trust in that. And we have worked out very good implementation plans. At the moment, the government of Vietnam already submitted and very soon uh, promulgate what they call is the action plan, the EDFTA. Um, we talk about enforcement. We talk about red tape. What we worry a bit is about red tape. Like uh, each and every industry, each and every ministry, they have their own way of understanding their own pace of implementing the commitment within the sectors under their competency. And that is something we are worried because we really want to have a good coordination among relevant agencies and ministries. And not about that, we also want to have very good communication to the stakeholders. Sometimes when I travel and I meet some some businesses like the Vietnamese companies, they still have they still ask very fundamental question about that. And I feel so worried. Now that is why at any time any of you would like to talk with me about HGA, don't hesitate. If you have a company, if you have a product you want to export to EU and you are not sure what step you need to do, I will try my best to accommodate your question. So it is the end of my presentation and I would like to <coughs> invite us to um, uh, to continue uh, with uh, his presentation. And I am very much interested in what he is going to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very informative. Uh, I think everyone agree with me with a lot of facts and a lot of information there and very insightful. He has been with the FTA for years, so he knows a lot of things. Thank you once again, uh, Mr. Kian. We will be back with you on the Q&A at the, uh, toward the end of the presentation. Now over to you, Dr. John Watts, uh, our program manager for international business program at RMIT Vietnam. All right, good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Uh, let me begin by uh, thanking you all for attending and thanking the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak to you here today. My name is John Walsh and I work here at the Hanoi campus of RMIT Vietnam. Uh, my subject today is the transformation and diversification of the Vietnamese economy under the Vietnamese EU free trade agreement. Uh, the next slide, please. So, we ask ourselves, why has the EU made a free trade agreement with Vietnam? Right? Uh, Vietnam is not the only country in the world. Uh, Vietnam may want a free trade agreement, but what is the reason for doing this? Is it because the people of the EU love Vietnam or love Vietnamese people and want Vietnamese people to be happy? No, it's because the EU can see the opportunity to make money and they will negotiate the, the free trade agreement in as tough a way as possible. We heard Mr. Kian saying how well Vietnamese negotiators responded by being tough, but this is not a labor of love, right? This is about money and the ways of making money. So we must bear in mind, first of all, that it's a, a commercial agreement with both sides trying to control control what is going on and it is also a dynamic agreement. In other words, even though the terms are written down, these are not the same conditions that exist today as will exist in 10 or 20 years time. So at the moment we see um, the composition of Vietnamese goods to the EU being uh, labor intensive, being commodities and so forth uh, with some more advanced products, but in 10 or 20 years that will have changed completely. So the benefits that the EU can get from uh, pen penetrating the Vietnamese market now with its more advanced products will switch to benefits that Vietnamese companies will be able to get in the EU later on when their own companies have developed. Okay, the next one, please. Now, 
I, you don't need me to remind you that we're living in a world of the coronavirus pandemic, and this has come about uh, quite suddenly and has uh, exposed to all of us how very vulnerable the, the world is and the global economy is to significant change and significant damage. And even though here in Vietnam it looks like we have seen uh, possibly the end of the first phase of this epidemic, it may come back again and it is still lapping around the world. We'll see places in uh, sub-Saharan Africa Central Asia and so forth, where health provision is less uh, strong than it is in um, countries where the, the epidemic has already struck, and so that the, the death rate and so forth is going to be very terrible there. And because of the interconnectedness of the modern world, um, we find that around the world there is a significant demand deficit. And this will hamper the ability of all states to recover because of the lack of efficient, uh, the lack of effective demand. Secondly, there is the destruction of human capital, which takes place every time people are unemployed or, un or are unable to express their full productivity. These two factors together will lead to uh, significant unemployment around the world. Um, will the world recover very quickly? Well, the American economist Paul Krugman believes that the, the, the comeback, the recovery will be very strong because he says that the coronavirus is an external force and the external force is preventing uh, supply and demand equalizing. Uh, once the external force is removed, either because uh, we, it becomes under control or we, we develop a means of vaccination and then a demand will come back strongly However, I think this under underplays the importance around the world of the the fact that people are frightened and they're staying at home and they don't want to come out and, and spend money. OK, so I mentioned this as the effect on the free trade agreement, which nobody could foresee uh, at the time when it was being negotiated. Uh, the next slide, please. OK, free trade agreements are in general win win situations. However, that does not mean that both sides will win equally uh, or at all stages. Okay? Within each individual sector, one country or one side is likely to benefit more than the other side. And in the future, that may change. But as long as both sides get some benefit, then the agreement will continue. OK, we look at a world in which uh, our agreement is of a win-win nature, whereas if we look at the nature of currently of the American uh, administration under Trump, his view on free trade agreements or on trade agreements generally is a zero sum uh, arrangement whereby one side one side wins and the other side loses. However, this free trade agreement is win win, but it's not symmetrical. OK, now the role of the free trade agreement will be to bring the country of Vietnam more intensively under capitalist production system. And Schumpeter tells us what, where there is capitalism there, there will be creative destruction and there will be winners and there will be losers. And when the EU can successfully export goods to Vietnam, uh, potential rivals or potential competitors in Vietnam are going to suffer because uh, until they can uh, recover by uh, perhaps through technology, tra technology transfer or spillover effects, they will not be able to compete with EU firms. So the role of the Vietnamese government in the future is to be taking care of those who are losing out from the process and those who are winning uh, where well, they can look after themselves. OK, the next one, please. OK, so in a world in which um, the relationships with the two major trading partners, America and China, are fraught with tension of different sides, this is an opportunity to look at how can the country Vietnam diversify its trading relationships and economic relationships around the world? And the first thing to say, of course, is that uh, Vietnam is rapidly moving up the production ladder so that whereas before it was dealing primarily in commodities, increasingly uh, branded goods and uh, technology led goods are becoming more prevalent. Secondly, there are opportunities to revive ex uh, relationships with co countries which had previously strong relationships with Vietnam, for example, France and Russia, through tourism, although tourism is problematic at the moment, and through the willingness of foreign people to engage in cultural productions, both here and in their home countries. 
There is also a third opportunity as um, Vietnam has become involved in other overseas markets through migrant work. So, for example, there are 20, 30,000 Vietnamese migrant laborers in Taiwan, and that represents a, quite a significant market in its own right, and the opportunity for Taiwanese goods to be brought back to Vietnam. So uh, uh, every time you see people drinking Taiwanese bubble tea, um, you can be reminded of how strong the relationship is between the two countries. Uh, next, please. OK, so I will focus on the final points here to say that once Vietnam has achieved the free trade agreement with the EU, other ASEAN countries are going to want to do the same thing. And whether this is done on the basis of most favoured nation status or not. Uh, this is a significant area of status for Vietnamese government who can take the lead in saying to particularly to Thailand where I was before here. I know fairly well that uh, if Vietnam has achieved this relationship with the EU, Thailand is going to, going to want to do the same thing as soon as possible. So this positions the Vietnamese government uh, diplomatically in a, in a better situation and there will be some benefits that come from this. Uh, the next please. And uh, finally, the, the free trade agreement does not exist in, um, in isolation. It exists in a framework of other agreements and uh, such as EVIPA, the EU-Vietnam uh, Investment Protection Agreement, which will strengthen uh, the ability of, com of companies to avoid um, interference as they would see it by a local government and to maintain their, their hold over their profits and so forth. Um, and as uh, Kian mentioned before, this includes includes also public procurement. Um, at the moment, we would anticipate that involves EU companies taking public uh, procurement opportunities in Vietnam. However, in the future, the same agreement will hold and when Vietnamese companies are strong enough to do the same thing, then they can go onto the front foot and uh, acquire opportunities in Europe. OK, I'm going to conclude at this point. So if you could skip to the to the end. The next one. OK, so there are many uh, challenges to this situation. Um, the transition periods are still in some cases are still quite long in a world in which product life cycles are generally accelerating. Um, it is possible that some of the trade which does will take place with the EU uh, it has the form of diversion rather than creation. And there is always the danger that with multiple agreements, we end up with what they call the noodle bowl effect, where you cannot tell where one noodle ends and the other one begins because there are so many complex things going on. But having said that, there are still opportunities and uh, you know these will, these will not happen for everybody, right? There are a lot of people who are going to suffer as well as a lot of people who are going to benefit from it. Uh, those who benefit now may not benefit later. Those who suffer now may not suffer later. But the, as I say, the role of the government here becomes clearer in identifying where uh, it must protect those people who are going to be negatively affected, uh, especially in the short term. OK, with that, I'm going to say thank you very much and I hand it back to Dr. Chung. Yeah. All right, um, thank you very much, Dr. John, for a really good presentation, short, concise, but uh, a lot of information there, and also, you know, with the reference to also to the uh, how American, how Donald Trump and other receive uh, FTA. Um, I think your presentation and key end present presentation is very nicely, you know, as a combination so that we have kind of the fact and also uh, kind of theories and uh, relate related to other country as well. So really good. Uh, I'm going to uh, recap in Vietnamese um, because we have parents join us in this event uh, in about three, four minutes maximum. I'll try to keep it short. And then we go for the Q&A. So if you have any question, you can text on the uh, uh, text box that uh, the our team provide and you see it and then text and then we will uh, answer those questions. I also try to provide some um, other updated uh, figure from from MTA so that uh, we can ask the speaker as well. À, xin cảm ơn uh, tất cả quý vị đã lắng nghe buổi uh, chuyên đề thảo luận uh, của trường uh, kinh doanh và quản trị uh, 
À, trong chủ đề ngày hôm nay thì các diễn giả là tiến sĩ John và ông Lê Kỳ Anh đã thảo luận về à, các cái thách thức cũng như là những cái lợi thế của Việt Nam khi tham gia cái hiệp định à, thương mại tự do EVFTA. Thì đây là một cái hiệp định à, thế hệ mới và có tác động rất là sâu rộng. À, trưa nay thì à, sáng nay thì Bộ trưởng À, thương mại à, bộ trưởng bộ công thương của chúng ta à, cũng đã trình bày trước quốc hội và chiều nay thì ngoài quốc hội đang thảo luận về chủ đề này và cũng đã trao đổi rất là nhiều là cái tác động sâu rộng nó như thế nào thì à, à, trải qua gần 10 năm phải mất 9 năm từ 2010 bắt đầu à, khởi động thì sau đó hai năm thì khởi động thì cho mãi tới à, năm tới 30 tháng 6 năm 2019 thì hai bên À, đã ký kết nhưng phải đợi cho tới nghị viện châu Âu vào ngày 12 tháng 2 năm 2020 có nghĩa là đầu năm nay thì họ đã ký và Việt Nam đợi Việt Nam chúng ta à, quyết định nữa thì ngoài ngoài cái hiệp định EVFTA thì chúng ta còn có hiệp định bảo hộ đầu tư thì cái hiệp định bảo hộ đầu tư thì nó sẽ à, có hiệu lực sau à, dự kiến là sau sau khi anh ra khỏi liên minh châu Âu mình đang nói EU là 28 nước trong đó có 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 anh thì hiệp định này như các diễn giả vừa trình bày nhất là phần của ông Kỳ Anh thì các sản phẩm mà doanh nghiệp chúng ta có rất nhiều lợi thế đó là những sản phẩm gỗ rồi điện thoại và linh kiện điện thoại thì chủ yếu là các doanh nghiệp FDI đối với những sản phẩm này đã đầu tư như Samsung ở Việt Nam thì nói thêm là xuất khẩu của họ là chiếm khoảng từ 20 cho tới gần 25% tổng kim ngạch xuất khẩu của chúng ta cho nên đây là những sản phẩm chủ yếu từ những doanh nghiệp lớn như vậy à, máy móc gia dụng như anh Kỳ Anh vừa nói đặc biệt là là dệt may và da dày à, thì mình đang có lợi thế rất lớn bởi vì khi giảm xuống thì các đối thủ cạnh tranh khác trong khu vực cũng sẽ khó cạnh tranh với chúng ta và hiện tại cái kim ngạch này cũng rất là lớn ở từ Việt Nam xuất đi thủy sản và các nông sản như cà phê và hạt điều có lợi thế rất là lớn để mà xuất sang cái thị trường này à, về à, về hàng nhập thì à, thì à, các sản phẩm chính mà chúng ta sẽ nhập đó là dược phẩm xe hơi rượu sữa và máy móc và thịt gà thì đó là những mặt mặt hàng mà 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 chúng ta sẽ có nhiều uh, nhập cái, cái khối lượng nhập trong thời gian tới sau khi hiệp định có hiệu lực thì dự kiến là quốc hội chúng ta sẽ sẽ đi kết vào ngày 28 về cái này và vote vào ngày 28 thì trong vòng khoảng gần 2 tháng trong vòng 2 tháng thì chúng ta sẽ có hiệu lực đối với hiệp định này và Tuy vậy thì chúng ta có rất nhiều thách thức nhân kiện có present đó thì thì và trong cái bài của John cũng như chúng tôi có nghiên cứu thì rất nhiều thứ ví dụ như là quy tắc xuất xứ rồi đáp ứng các cái quy chuẩn cái compliance với họ rồi rồi về mua sắm công về năng lực rồi tất cả rồi phát triển bền vững cho nên cũng rất là khó khăn cho doanh nghiệp Việt chúng ta đặc biệt là sau cái trận dịch bệnh Covid-19 này sẽ rất là khó Tuy vậy thì thì hy vọng với cái sức bật của doanh nghiệp thì họ có thể đáp ứng được và tận dụng được cái lợi thế. Tôi chỉ nói thêm một điểm là ở đây á, là tại sao nó rất là quan trọng. À, tiến sĩ John và tôi có 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 viết mấy bài báo về gần đây thì cũng nói rõ cái điểm này. Đó là nếu như chúng ta nhìn thấy cái số liệu mà xuất xăng EU á, năm 2019, cuối 2019 thì chúng ta xuất là 41,5 tỷ và chúng ta nhập 15 tỷ thì như vậy là chúng ta có cái surplus là 26,5 tỷ. Trong khi đó chúng ta xuất qua qua China, qua Trung Quốc cũng bằng con số đó luôn là 41 nhưng mà chúng ta nhập tới 75 tỷ rưỡi và như vậy chúng ta đang âm tới 34 tỷ. À, có nghĩa là là bị deficit. Trong khi xuất qua Mỹ thì chúng ta xuất rất cao là 61 mà nhập chỉ có 14 là chúng tôi rất rất là lo tại vì chính chính quyền Trump họ chỉ để ý con số này là dương 47 tỷ cho chúng ta có nghĩa là họ deficit 47 tỷ trong năm vừa rồi thì rất nguy hiểm cho nên cái việc mà có được cái hiệp định này và thâm nhập thị trường EU là rất là cần thiết đối với Việt Nam và Việt Nam đang nhìn theo ở châu Á chỉ có chỉ có Hàn Quốc và chỉ có um, Singapore Singapore là năm trước Hàn Quốc thì 5 năm trước và họ làm từ 2012 nhưng 5 năm trước thì mới chính thức thì Việt Nam đang theo con đường đó tuy vậy thì thì Việt Nam đang gặp rất là nhiều khó khăn bởi vì về môi trường kinh doanh thì không thể nào cạnh tranh so với 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 Hàn Quốc và Singapore và những cái cái môi trường kinh doanh của chúng ta cũng không bằng và những cái ứng dụng về công nghệ ở chính phủ cũng không bằng à, thì đó là những cái thách thức mà chúng ta phải đối mặt và chính các doanh nghiệp và ngay cả chính phủ cũng phải cố gắng phải nỗ lực phải làm giống như Singapore phải giống như Hàn Quốc thì chúng ta mới mong 
được những thu được những cái lợi như chúng ta đang tính toán hiện tại thì đó là một một số cái recap cũng giống cung cấp thêm thông tin cho cho quý vị để để hiểu rõ thêm về hiệp định này thì bây giờ chúng ta sẽ quay sang phần Q&A và thời gian nó có qua một chút thì thì chúng ta sẽ kết thúc vào lúc 5 giờ 15 có nghĩa là chúng ta khoảng, có khoảng 12 phút để để trao đổi các Q&A nếu quý vị có câu hỏi à, nếu quý vị không có câu hỏi thì tôi cũng đang chuẩn bị rất nhiều câu hỏi ở đây để hỏi các vị à, à, diễn giả của mình à, và bây giờ tôi à, quay lại à, chương trình bằng tiếng Anh xin cảm ơn mọi người à, Thank you, uh, Dr. John Walsh and um, uh, Mr. Lekian. Um, not sure if we have any question. Yeah, we have quite a big question, quite a lot of question here for the uh, speakers. So let me go with the uh, first one. Um, uh, EVFTA and Trump administration pushing. Uh, 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 to drift the global supply chain from China and that's a good for vietnam but what do you think china will do to vietnam so so kind of evfta and and trump action to china uh, so it seemed to be good for vietnam but uh, as according to thien nguyen he, he worry about the the maybe maybe the negative you know, action from china what do you think john on on this regard so any any forecast on the, from china because seem like trump will withdraw and divert and play hard bones with 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 the uh, china right and uh, and also evfta would be good for vietnam so tian asked any negative impact you know action from uh, china on well vietnam. i'm i'm reminded of um a proverb from when i lived in korea which said when the whales fight the shrimps better get out of the way and i think uh, we have a similar situation here if, if america and china are going to start fighting with each other there's going to be a great deal of turbulence uh, which is not going to be beneficial to anybody um, there may be some occasions where um, some vietnamese companies will benefit from this contract or that contract but on the whole um, uh, damage to the global economy will affect everybody um, the world is now so interconnected and, and vietnam is so closely joined to value chains which uh, crisscross the world and across borders so many different places that a general level of turbulence will not be good for anybody okay there will as i said before there will be some winners but there overall it will be a bad situation mm. very good thank you john um i also add to that one we have a lot of problem with china right now in your article we also saw a shutdown of the border we have immediately 25 percent um of the uh, total export to china will be imparted for example so so yeah agree with you now we have a question from shat chung gan uh, han he asked she or he asked a question about to to kian so kian back online already kian yeah, are you I'm there okay yeah. good uh so the question would be so given the uh due to the covid 19 impact uh in the eu how would this impact um, you know affect the uh, eu economic relationship with vietnam uh thank you very much uh sha for the question and uh, to you i can tell you there are only two approaches when you face a pandemic like covid 19 you can either backtrack to protectionist protectionism or you will decide to make a bold and strong move and the EU have decided to, to do the other way. Uh, between you and Vietnam, during COVID-19, uh, I was among a member of the team which uh, assigned specific, specifically for removing the problem. And we even have gone further. And COVID cannot negatively impact the trade flow between you and Vietnam. Uh, we not only, we have worked and asked for special special mechanism where the exporters they do not need to present the original papers of of, of the the import and export uh, certificates for plant and animal products and they just need to send the scan version of the paper for example so i, I can tell you the example to, to to calm you down that actually covid 19 of course it is having impact but that impact is not that strong on the EU Vietnam connection. To avoid it in the future, we 
I think once the EDFGA are in place, we have special mechanism to deal with the crisis. The thing I just refer to you, simplify procedures for import and exports of the products. Um, the pandemic also exposed to one key question. You always want to sell, you always want to export, but one day you want to keep some products. So is it legitimate that you keep your products and you stop suddenly kind of the disruption of supply? Is it legitimate? It is something ongoing under the debate. But I think between you and Vietnam, there will be very constructive approach to such issues because we are fully aware of the negative impact on the economy, on the companies, on the consumers, once you rely so much on one supplier, and then you lost the supplier when you need it. It is something we are working on it. Uh, if, you are recall, if, if I can recall you, things like the ban of medical masks by Vietnam for about one month uh, or more, or the ban of re-export of some medical products, from Vietnam, or the ban of export of rice, all those things, we will try to discuss and to find out a good way uh, under the FTA or even under the WTO agreement. You, if you notice, you will see there is one special case where you can apply urgent matter if there is a threat to your national interest. That countries are encouraged not to uh, abuse such approach, not to abuse the measure. Um, we are living in a world which is not perfect, but with the effort and with the construction from both sides, we can handle it. And I can guarantee you between you and Vietnam, there are good spirit of cooperation right now and have been there for many years to resolve all the issues. Right. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. I think we have another three questions um, down there um, that I can see right now. So let's go with the Dũng Nguyen, Dũng Nguyen questions. And he he seemed to worry about, for example, the case of Vina, if I'm, I'm because that's a long question. So kind of if you export to you, EU, you need to, let's say uh, some, some products that are compliant with the requirement, you need to kind of, you know, have the local supplier. And actually the country like Vietnam, they don't have sufficient local suppliers, so they can't import it from other country, which is not in the, the FTA yet. Let's say from China, you can't import the parts from China to make a, a product and export to, to the EU. So so in, in, in that scenario, so, is that really good or what can we do with the the poor participation of the local suppliers in this case? So, uh, John, can you help answer this question? Um, well, one way to, to deal with this is to allow the incoming investing firms to help the local firms reach the level required. And I will give the example in Thailand of Tesco Lotus. Uh, when mm. Tesco Lotus first came to Thailand, where they have opened numerous supermarkets of all different sizes, Thai econ the Thai agricultural system was not nearly as good as it is today, and the individual farmers could not produce uh, high quality or consistent production. But because Tesco mm. worked with the local farmers with the blessing of the local government, uh, the Tesco mm. could enter into contracts with farmers, work with them to get the level of consistency and required and QA and so forth and now Thai production goes into the export market because Tesco organizes the whole value chain for them and I would say I know that uh, retail is, is a sensitive subject in many countries but in some cases it could be possible to permit uh, the foreign firm to take a bigger role in organizing the supply chain locally uh, with incentive to work with local firms because it will because that will be a win-win situation. Right. Thank you very much. I think there's two questions, but long Nguyen question I will answer shortly. Um, uh, long worry about the deficit that we have, that you, the European have with Vietnam uh, as of now. So he, he worry whether it's US, you know, like US did with China, 
and then and Trump even show some size to Vietnam with the deficit that Vietnam, uh, the surplus Vietnam have with the, his country. So his question would be whether is there you know a possibility that you you, you would do the same. Uh, I would say that before they cite um, the deal, um, this is actually uh, on February this year, so they all consider everything. And again, this is not one country. If we don't count UK, it's 27 country. And in this in this block, we have the in top 10 economies of the of the world. There are three economies. It means German, uh, France, and and UK in there, right? So if if we count UK, so. 27, so about 28 uh, billions is not a big deal. So I, I would say that they signed the deal and they consider everything. So uh, I do believe that they got not going to be, but the problem remained like we, we, we discussed. Now go to the last question from um, Dr. Nuno. Um, I guess uh, our uh, senior lecturers uh, in charge of tourism, um, program uh, research cluster at RMIT as well. So he asked, do you think that the role of international tourism will be and or how international tourism fluxes uh, will be affected by the EV FTA, uh, FTA in the upcoming years? So um, I give this to uh, Mr. Kian. So can you have answer that question, Kian? It will be very positive in short. But uh, if I may, uh, I would like to tell you uh, actually, um, the EVFTA not only uh, encourage the connection um, in terms of economics or trade or investments, but it also uh, helps to create a cultural linkage. Uh, if you notice uh, between Vietnam and EU now, uh, we are moving closer and closer to each other. And uh, Vietnam has become a quite popular uh, destination for many European uh, visitors. They really like Vietnam, and Vietnam have very friendly image, very good image among European people. Nice. Uh, it is something very important, although it is intangible, but it has a lot of meaning, a lot of impact on decision of the European citizen once they decide where to spend their money in their entertainment time. Uh, Dr. Chung, can I come back to the previous um, question about the rule of origin? About the world, yeah, shortly because, because we ran very out shortly. time already. So one one minute, yeah. Yeah, very shortly. I just want to tell you that uh, you have a very legitimate worry about whether or not uh, the supplies in Vietnam are strong enough uh, mm -hmm. to provide for the production before the products can be exported to the EU. Yep. There are two things. First, don't forget the circumvention. Once the EDFTA was negotiated, we talk mm -hmm. a lot about the convention. Because this is the FTA for Vietnam, for Vietnamese companies, for Vietnamese producers, we do not expect and do not, we do not want any well-disguised company from other mm. country right. to, Let's to, say to from pretend China, that right? it is from, yep. yeah, to yep. pretend that it is Vietnamese and export to the mm. EU. But mm. at the same time, we care about the short supplies. So I can tell you, the FTA between EU and Vietnam is not only between the two parties. Mm -hmm. Vietnamese textiles and garment industry, they can use the fabrics from South Korea yep. because South yep. Korea is also a, Part of it, yeah. a, a, a partner in an FTA with the EU. So Vietnam has an FTA with Korea, Vietnam has an FTA with EU, EU has an FTA with Korea. That is why we decided that Vietnamese producers of apparels can use a fabric from uh, South Korea mm -hmm. for the production in Vietnam, and that products are recognized as satisfying rule of origin. So right. all the aspects of production, of supply chain and short supplies have been thinking carefully and have yeah. been uh, resolved under the FTA. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, before we end this um, section, I would say uh, all of the uh, discussion today will be recorded and we also put in our internet so that we can come back and listen or watch anytime. Apart from this, we also provide our researcher 
uh, articles uh, from you know this aspect and also many other like tourism from Dr. Nuno and from our other program managers on how to deal with COVID, how to manage and um, in, in the company, how to work from home, how to nurture the talent and all sort of you know, related topic from our school will be posted in there. We will send you the link after this. Um, next topic for for the uh, the business talk number three in our school would be next week next Wednesday on 27 May we send you the link um, uh, of, of the details the topic for the next talk would be impacts of COVID-19 to the marketing industry local and global perspective so we, we already see the uh, presenter from uh, local and also international um, uh, presenter joining that that section as well. So looking forward to welcome all of you in the next event. Uh, before we uh, conclude our section today, I would like once would like to once again to thank you very much, Mr. Kian, for all the things that My you pleasure. have been doing for our students and also for today's talks. Um, early on, he also presented to the students, student lovers, and uh, and now the second time that he helped the school. So once again, on behalf of the leadership of the school, we thank you so much for, for your support. Uh, thank you, Dr. John Walsh, for your insightful analysis on this topic and also all the articles that you have wrote on this topic, uh, have written on, on this topic as well. Thanks all the teams and all the participants in, in today's talk. I hope that it uh, it helped uh, and it provide you insightful and also informative um, information and analysis. Um, thank you. Thank you very much and looking My pleasure. forward to, thank you. Yeah, to see you thank again. You. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Bye for now.